in color. The continuing story of Peyton Place. Starring Ed Nelson as Michael Rossi. Ryan O'Neill as Rodney Harrington. Barbara Parkins as Betty Anderson. Christopher Connolly as Norman Harrington. Patricia Morrow as Rita Harrington. James Douglas as Stephen Cord. The Reverend Tom Winter has served his congregation faithfully ever since he came to Peyton Place a year ago. But the Tom Winter in the chapel, in the hospital, in the homes of the sick and feeble, and the Tom Winter who tonight finds himself on a road behind Ada Jack's tavern, are two different people. Are you all right? Where's Kelly? Is she all right? Why did you run away from me? You know as well as I do. Now, I can't apologize for my feelings or the way I behave. Do you understand? Look, I don't want to hear it. Jill, we need each other. No. Yes. The girl you are, the girl you can become. I need you. And you need someone who will take care of you and Kelly. We need each other. Please, it isn't like that. It can't be like that. Look, it isn't often that it happens that two people meet at just the right moment in their lives. I couldn't help you. I don't have the ability to help you. You need someone with a mind like yours, someone who needs you. Your wife, she needs you more than ever now. No. No, whatever we have is gone. This is a selfish thing to say, Jill. But I can fulfill my life with you. I can help you, don't you see? But there's no way I can help you. I can create a life for you. I can make it right for you and Kelly. I can create an atmosphere that, that would allow you to grow. Now, don't, don't take me wrong. I don't think I'm the, the great leader or the infallible personality. I need you just as much as you need me. I'd give anything to buy it back. There was a time when Dr. Rossi told me about a job interview. All I had to do was go to your house and talk to you about it. I had hesitated. You wouldn't have pushed me. Why would you want to buy it back? Sure, these last weeks have been awkward, even painful. But if this is the way it ends, it's certainly worth it, isn't it? I don't love you. Not the way you mean. Then why didn't you leave the house before? When you first sensed something was happening? Why did you stay? I tried to leave. Don't you remember? I remember. I held the door shut tight. Please, I can't argue with you. Jill, look. We have a lifetime ahead of us, you, me, and Kelly. A lifetime. Please, leave me alone. Jill, I... Please. He's going to fidget on that bench all through the sermon. But I must admit, when I was a boy, I found it hard to behave in church. I never went to church when I was a kid. Well, I don't think the Almighty keeps records. Rita, I'm glad you called me. I'm glad that you're here. All the same, I feel sort of bad just coming when I need something. I kind of think that's what he's there for, when you need something. Well, it's not for me so much, or even for Norm. 
Although he's taking it awfully hard. But Rod is so low. Norm's over there right now, but I bet Rod won't talk to him. He won't even complain. He just lies there. And you know what he must be thinking. It's a terrible thing. I know we're lucky he's even alive. But the way he is now, I can't bear to see him. You've got to think positively. Rod has a lot in his favor. He's got a good doctor, a plucky wife, family, and friends, and his own will. Well, that's what I'm worried about. He doesn't have any patience with being sick. He's just like Norm that way. In fact, I don't think he can face how long this is going to take. That's why I'm here to see Reverend Winter after the service. If he could get through to me and help me, I, I'm sure he can do the same for Rod. I'm sure that he'll talk with him when he can spare the time. I wonder what's keeping the reverend. Usually you can set your clock by him. Do you think maybe he's sick or something? Uh, maybe I'll see what's doing. Excuse me, Mrs. Winter. I don't mean to intrude, but the service should have started several minutes ago. The people out there are getting restless. I was wondering, is there anything wrong? Should there be? Well, I was wondering if your husband didn't feel well. Maybe, is he sick? I guess he is sick. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, how come you didn't let us know? I didn't feel up to it. Understand. If your husband's sick and there's to be no service, the people out there have a right to know. And they should have the plain facts. I don't think the people would want to hear the plain facts. I don't see what you're getting at. Maybe I should speak to him. Where is Reverend Winter? It's a good question. Where is Reverend Winter? I don't know. I have a pretty good idea. Where? Out chasing some lost sheep. At least I put it in the biblical sense. Look here, that's no way for a minister's wife to talk. Why, am I different from any other woman, any other wife? That's a fool question, and you know it. You have a responsibility to those people out there and to your husband. Right, the show must go on. Well, what do you suggest? That I make a curtain speech and then break out the bingo? You know what you have to do. You have to go out there and tell them that your husband's ill, that there won't be any service today, and that he hopes they'll excuse him. You think you're up to that? We'll have to take our chances. What makes you think I won't expose him? Because you're the minister's wife. I know we all enjoy listening to Mrs. Matsey's organ playing, but sometimes it's possible to get too much of a good thing, even a hymn. I'm sure you're all wondering where my husband is. Well, I'd like to make a confession. The reason he isn't here is my fault. You see, he's um, incommunicado. He wanted very much to conduct the service this morning, but I persuaded him that what he's suffering from would hardly help his congregation. Mm. You see, he has severe laryngitis. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I won the argument. <laughs> well, I do hope you accept his apologies. And I think it would be nice, uh, I know my husband would approve, if you'd all remain seated for a few minutes. As you know, he's a great believer in private meditation. Thank you. I don't think so. 
Mr. Harrington, your brother's here to see you. I'll be right outside. Mr. Harrington, your brother's here to see you. It'd be too bad if you really were asleep. Well, sir, being self-appointed chairman of the board of Harrington Brothers, Inc., I came over here to give you a financial report. The Dow Jones average on yesterday's volume at the bike shop went up five points, five big ones. It was a great day for the Harrington Brothers. Take the sign down, Norman. What, you have a bad day? Well, this ought to cheer you up. Little Norm yesterday, he sold two bikes, not one, but two. One was Wolfpack Scrambler, the biggest one we have in stock, and absolutely loaded. You know which one I mean? Well, then I'll tell you. It's a 250cc two-stroke twin. The one with the metallic paint job and chrome all over the front suspension. And you talk about instrumentation. I sold a guy one of the most expensive speedometers and tachometers. Well, I cried all the way to the bank. As a matter of fact, it's getting so good there, we might have to hire somebody just temporarily till you get out of the hospital and back on your feet. All right. Drop it. I was coming on a little strong one night. Look at me. Not my face. They do kind of have you hung up, don't they? Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, this, this is the way it is. It's just an operation, Rod. They want to keep you immobilized until... Tell you heal up, that's all. Sure. Sure, he says. Look, Rod, I know what you're going through. Because I've been right there. Right where you are now. With my head in the brace. Feeling all the pain and hating the world. Because I'm your brother. I wish... that I were. Yeah, I know. You're thinking, what about my arms? What about my legs? I can't feel anything. I can't move them. Even when I do heal, I still won't be able to move them. What kind of life is that, right? Right. No lectures, okay? Is it a lecture to tell you that we all prayed for you? Betty, doctors, me, all of us. Why? Why? Yes, why? If I had been killed, it would have been better for everybody. But you have a wife now. That's what I mean. Well, you're wrong. That's the way you want it, isn't it? No fight, no nothing, just give up. Boy, you're really pulling out all the stops, aren't you, Rod? You know, I thought I felt pretty bad, but that's just a waste of time. You feel bad enough for the both of us, for all of us. All right, you've got a beautiful wife. What do you think she is? She'll live. I don't know. I really don't know. I guess I expected you to give more of a fight. Look, the doctors say there's a chance you can walk everything. Well, that's something. They haven't given up on you. Look, it's worth a try, Rod. It's worth a fight. Hey, hey. I felt that. I felt that, Norm. I'm not kidding. I, when you hit the bed, I felt that. What do you want me to do? Get the doctor right now. Go, I mean that. Go. All right. Nurse? Nurse? Look, anything the matter? No, I, I hit the bed and he felt something. He felt something? Yeah. Dr. Mazel, just down the corridor. I'll okay. get him. I'll get him. Look, Rod, that's what I've been trying to tell you. To stick with it. Today a finger, tomorrow the world. All right, what's going on? What's all the excitement? I accidentally hit the bed, doctor, and, well, he felt something. Oh, really? Where? In my left hand, doctor. Just like a... I don't know. It, it pins and needles. It's mm -hmm. I can feel it. Yeah. Let's see. Feel that? Yeah, I really do. Good. How about that? No. Hmm? What does it mean? Oh, it just means a gradual process. Feeling isn't going to return all at once. You know. Try the other hand. Feel that? No, I can't. I don't understand. How can, how can I feel one hand and, and, and then nothing? How can that be? Well, usually in cases like this, uh, once feeling begins, starts, uh, prognosis is pretty good. Now, Rod, I'm going to have some tests made, but I don't want you to break out any champagne, okay? <laughs> okay. Oh, nurse. You want me to call Ben? 